Hello, my name is Chip Killian, and today I'll be talking to you about Orion, which is Google's software-defined networking control plane. As you can see, I'm one of many authors, co-authors of this paper, and this is a small group uh, among the many people that have contributed to Orion and its development over the past several years. Uh, in this talk, I will not have time to tell you everything we do with Orion or even everything that's in the paper. So I encourage you to also read the paper and to reach out to me or any of the other authors with questions to learn more about what we do at Google or if you're interested in joining our team. So without further ado, let me tell you what is Orion. Orion is Google's second generation SDN control plane. We took this as an opportunity to take what we'd learned from the first generation, which we called Onyx, and to rebuild a new controller from the ground with everything we'd learned from that. Orion is responsible for configuration, for management, for the real-time control of all of our networks, all of our data center networks, that's Jupiter, all of our campus networks, and all of our private wide area networks, also known as B4. Uh, we've had Orion in production for more than four years. Orion is at its heart, a microservices based architecture with a pub sub network information base that we call the NIB. Orion is an evolving platform. We've been doing bi-weekly software releases, which has allowed us to deliver uh, over 30 new significant capabilities. We've increased the scale that Orion supports by a factor of 16, its availability for Jupiter by a factor of 50, and its avail availability for B4 by a factor of 100. Uh, and in doing so, we've also improved its convergence time by a factor of 40. So let me tell you a little bit about the software principles that we used when building Orion. Orion is at its heart a, a intent-based system. So what that means is that higher level applications will specify policies or intents or other ways of saying, this is the state I want the network to be in. And the controller, the microcontrollers, the set of microcontrollers collectively together reconcile that intent with the ground truth. So the ground truth at the lowest layer would be what is the configuration of the network? What is the state of the network devices and the links and the ports? And what flows are programmed on those devices? And so the controller at a, at a macro level is taking the high level intent and the low level state and reconciling them. And so it is continually taking those inputs, reconciling them in the least disruptive way so that we don't lose traffic while we are making changes to the network. And then of course, each controller, each microcontroller can be thought of as its own microcosm of this, where higher level intent reconciles with lower level ground truth and we layer those on top of each other. So you might have a, a piece that does intra-block, sorry, inter-block routing, a piece that does intra-block routing and a piece that does per node flow programming, for example. So, and then in Orion, we store all of these intents and all of these ground truths in this pub sub network information base that we call the NIB. So by storing them in the NIB, that allows us to uh, do debugging based on this information. It allows the operators to be able to see a sequentialized view of how the states change over time. And in order to see what's going on, we can pull all of the information from all of our uh, deployed NIBs and track them in one place. And that means that when our operators are operating the network, they don't need to worry about capturing state for debugging later if something goes wrong. It's already there. It's in a nice sequential fashion. We can replay it very easily. So we're thinking of Orion as a continuous reconciliation system where at all points in time, you have the intent, the state you wanna be in and the ground truth, which is the current state of the world. And what the controller is doing, its algorithm basically is always uh, continually reconcile. Whenever any of the inputs change, you reconcile them. So if a network device fails, then the network controller observes this as a ground truth change and it reconciles the intent to route around that device in order to get traffic to where it needs to go. There are some other reconciliation events that we have to talk about that are, that are special in other ways. So a typical event would be a microcontroller within the Orion system failing. And when it restarts, it needs to uh, rebuild its internal controller state and then just continue operating, right? In this world where you have the shared data stored in the NIB, a microcontroller's intent and its ground truth are always being preserved. And so in a typical failure, that state is maintained and you just restart the controller, rebuild your data structures and continue going. There's a different special case when, it's, when you might lose or corrupt a, a portion of that state. And in that case, we use what we call the capability reconciliation protocol. In the capability reconciliation protocol, the microcontrollers 
uh, perform an orderly reconciliation by uh, expressing the state that they need in order to do their reconciliation and the state that they provide for others to do reconciliation from in the form of abstract capabilities. So an application will block on the abstract capabilities that it needs, and then it will explicitly mark those capabilities that it provides so that other applications that are waiting on those capabilities can proceed. So this capability reconciliation allows us to rebuild the controller state from complete ground truth. You know, so you can take an entire Orion controller down, erase any state stored except for what's in the network, and then bring the controller back up and rebuild the state and continue going without losing any traffic at all. Now, having done this, uh, that simplifies many things. For example, we can take all failures and map them to either a typical controller failure or this special case failure where we lose the data and need to, and need to reconcile. And this is great for our operators, especially because it means that whenever a problem happens in production, they can typically either restart the microcontroller that's misbehaving or restart the capability reconciliation protocol in order to rebuild the state from the ground. And then we'd simply test very well this process of doing reconciliation and building the, the state from the ground. Now, thinking of it as a continuous reconciliation system, the other thing you have to keep in mind, of course, is that convergence speed matters because uh, when you're doing convergence, either because of one of these controller failures or just because of a network failure or because of the capability reconciliation, this convergence window, the time from the stimulus changing and the state being updated to reflect that stimulus, uh, that either reflects a loss of traffic because of the failure, for example, or a loss of the ability to control the system should something go wrong. And so one of the key metrics that we've had to work on optimizing in Orion is in fact how fast this reconciliation takes place. Another issue that comes up in a centralized controller where you are, are operating the network devices over an asynchronous network itself is that uh, just because a network device disconnects from the controller does not mean that that network device has in fact failed. Uh, and in our experience, what we find is that in fact, the controller connection failures to the network device are more common than data plane network failures. Now, what does that mean? It means that if the controller sees a disconnection from a, from, from a switch, uh, that doesn't mean the switch has failed. And in most cases, in fact, if it does absolutely nothing, uh, it's doing the right thing because the traffic is probably still flowing through the data plane switch. However, uh, we need to route around failures quickly. And so you have to balance this do nothing to wait and see with the uh, possibility that you need to route around a failure quickly. And the approach that we take for this is that if a small number of network elements have failed, then we will be pessimistic and we will assume that they are in fact failed and we will click quickly route around them as you can see as we go from the no failure case at the bottom to the fail closed case where two of these nodes have gone down from the perspective of the controller and we route the traffic around them. If more nodes go down from this state, however, and it starts to look like a larger or a correlated failure case, the controller switches from the mode where it is pessimistic, assuming that they're down, to a mode where it is optimistic and assuming, you know, probably this isn't a case where, you know, all of these switches failed at once, but instead probably there was some control plane network failure and I can no longer reach them. And so it will be, start to be optimistic. And in the optimistic state, it goes into a fail static mode where it stops making changes to the configuration of the, of the flows because when you make those changes, you may actually create loops because you don't have a good view into the state of the network if you can't see the state of the network. So when we can't see the state of the network, the preference is to leave the network in its last known good state. So this is what we call fail static. Now, I only have a short time left. Instead of telling you about the performance, which you can see in the paper, I'm going to tell you one of the stories from the paper about uh, situations that where we didn't do as well as we could have, or otherwise we had a, a problem. And this is about uh, the blast radius of uh, changes of configurations that take place in the network and how you need to align those with the network itself so that you don't have a problem in, in zone A affecting zones B and C. So we had already done a good job with, with some of these things where the controller, the Orion controller jobs were physically co-located near the devices that they were controlling. And this is important because for example, uh, if they're in the same power domain, then when the power goes out, you lose the devices and the controllers at the same time. If they're in different power domains, then if you lose 
one of the power domains, it affects both the controllers and the switches, regardless of which power domain you lose. So we had already done that. But in 2019, we had this outage where we were uh, where we had configured a bunch of the Orion jobs across a large geographic region to have the same virtual job management grouping. And we didn't realize at the time what the implication of that was. Uh, and But we did in this event because what happened was that there was a facility maintenance event and this virtual job management grouping was tied to that facility. And so that that configuration meant that it uh, a series of other misconfigurations when we when we did the facility maintenance event it disabled it took down all the Orion jobs in that virtual group. This caused a large failure, larger than what our networks were designed to tolerate, and exposed a gap in our uh, fail static implementation for BGP, which led to routes being withdrawn, uh, which caused a user visible outage, which is why in the paper we have linked to the external incident showing what was going on. And this is interesting because it, it happened even, even though the data plane forwarding was generally not disrupted. It was, it was operating in a static mode where the traffic was still being forwarded because after all, if you can't control the switches, you're not removing the flows from the switches. Uh, but we withdrew the routes and so the users saw a failure. So the conclusion is that you have to be very careful when you're aligning all of these blast radii. And in particular, uh, even this you know, sort of virtual job management and the, the building maintenance events, they also have to be considered in this blast radius. So we've, we've now gone back and, and thought about this some more. All right, so I'm about out of time. Uh, thanks again to everyone who watches this. Uh, thank you again to everybody who helped me write the paper and to collect, you know, contributed to our ion over the years. Here's an email address where you can reach us and uh, thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye.